Hella is a £79 million um, research laboratory development uh, for University of Cambridge. They wanted a, a fast track build, um, they had a specific criteria financially. As a result of that we looked at some really fast track methods of construction, precast, precast frame, precast facade panels, those elements all together really trying to reduce that, that on-site period and overlap it as much as possible with the design period. What they've done is we've designed it so that the facade, the window panel can be all sort of manufactured off-site, bought site, craned in. The client initial expectations being the five years, 60 month period, whereas we're looking to complete it in 42 months. We were given the project as a greenfield site, so originally it was a, a cricket field for the university. So we initially did a site strip, just clearing the, the grass away from the, at the surface of the, uh, the ground, and then um, installed a hoarding, and then we started to construct the basement. So that involved installation of sheet piles around the perimeter of the building. We then dug out to a, a base level and installed some props horizontally across the basement. And then following that was the construction of an inner layer of precast. We then followed up with columns and the ground floor slab, which are delta beams and precast uh, hollow core planks. Uh, this carried on through the rest of the levels with the cores being installed first, then columns, uh, precast edge beams and precast hollow core planks then following for the remaining levels up to the, the roof. Uh, when we finished the frame elements, we then installed the perimeter um, envelope. Uh, this was installed in four or five weeks, so a very, very quick period of time, wrapping around the building um, from level two up to the roof level. Following completion of the um, precast envelope panels, the uh, steel frame to the roof was installed, uh, and that's the completion of the frame elements. We have our inter internal gateway process to, um, to decide whether a project is suitable for BIM um, and it's by default it will be BIM unless there's a number of reasons that you know, mitigate and where we can't implement. It's a very large project, there's a lot of financial implications of the project. Um, it was deemed that this one should, should be a, one of the candidates for getting, getting the processes in place. And we've been on a steady path ever since, so this has been a, a trailblazer in a way. Um, for setting up our, our own BIM protocols and how they might, how they might work. This is a two-stage design and build, um, but actually Contractor is on board right from the concept design, so Reba One. We already had our design team, we were able to sit down with them um, and effectively do a BIM kickoff meeting. We had a start of an EIR. Um, the university deployed some consultants, as most people do, to come in and, and talk us through the, the process. Um, honestly, when I first picked it up, it was about that, that thick and, and, it, and it wasn't project specific. Um, but the, the nice thing with um, Cambridge University, they are really open to engaging with the supply chain and start to you know, finesse that document to something that could be delivered against. We did a lot of reverse engineering, taking what we had, um, going back to the IKEA and their supply chain and said, OK, what's your BEP? Let's have a look at your BEP. What were the questions that your um, BIM execution plan um, was answering. We're getting to the point where not only does it satisfy what the university wants, it allows the uh, supply chain to actually deliver it. BIM Extra was our common data environment for the project. Um, the BIM Extra essentially is a relational database um, where we can bring the models, the geometry, share information and actually deliver the, the data side, the non-graphical information side of the, uh, of the project deliverables. The way that works, um, we set up fortnightly model information exchanges um, where each consultant, uh, subcontractor or task teams in the PAS terminology um, input their, their model geometry and data to the system. That's then available to anyone on the project set up on the, on, on the system um, and allows people to only effectively access the latest information. So th there is that revision history there, but it's the most up-to-date information that everyone's looking at. You wouldn't want to federate all the models together at any one time but you sort of pick and choose what you want to look at at that point in time. Um, so certainly for the BIM workshops, the fortnightly coordination workshops uh, we carry out, we'll set an agenda, we'll, we'll see what services we want to look at, um, what, what parts of the building and then federate uh, as required. You had to sort of 
think quite a lot about how, say, a detail was going to work. You had to sort of think about that whole situation a lot early on. It, it made you think about how is this going to be built, you know, how is it going to be phased, how is it going to be brought to site, and, you know, it, it, it sort of created lots of questions for you to answer quite at an early stage, which is quite good because you don't then go down the design process and find there's a big significant problem. Bizarrely, everyone is working in Revit. Um, that's not something we've specified by any means. Honestly, it does make interoperability easier. Um, so, so yeah, so we have four subcontract trays currently working as well, collaborating into the projects uh, using Revit, albeit using a number of plugins to get those fabrication parts um, delivered in the models. As with all research facilities, um, lab facilities, this building is heavily serviced with M&E components. The design analysis for energy um, and obviously BRIAM requirements was carried out in the BIM environment using the Revit model that was exported to IES software. We were absolutely convinced that we needed to get the subcontractor on board early to work with the consultant. So we got SES on board um, at the start of Reba 3 to sit and work with Arup. Um, access to the models, to the drawings, obviously the common data environment, um, to, to work with them to, to create a buildable design. The m and &E subcontractor came on board um, and took control of our model and started to develop it further for installation purposes. That coordination of the design to enable us to start on site was really helped an awful lot by BIM. Uh, the coordination between the precast and the MEP is, is very, very important in order to get the, uh, the MEP integrated within the, the precast frame, which has to be fixed at an early stage. We were able to discuss, not only discuss drawn outputs with them, but actually get in there and, and open up the models so they could appreciate the 3D space effectively. There's an, an immediacy to it, you're quite close to the process. Things can be looked at and altered um, or suggestions taken on board much more quickly than they could be in the conventional setup. It makes the end user very, very close to it. And once they start talking about where they're sitting, you've kind of got past some of those earlier design issues that you, um, that you can come across in these sort of projects. And we've developed a, a detailed 4D model, specifically for the frame, with each individual element being modelled uh, and, and a programme associated with that. So we can look every week at each individual item of the frame that's being installed and the guys really have a good perception of, of what's actually going to happen. I think often we use markups on layouts and things like that, which work relatively well floor by floor, but when you've got multiple levels being constructed, over a week because of the, the speed of the frame construction. I think that's, the 40's really, really helped with, with that and the guys being able to understand what's happening. We used BIM Extra and we used Insight, um, both of which are, are very good tools for, for what we were doing. It enabled us to not create just a one-off 4D simulation, but an ongoing progressive simulation that we could use for comparisons between actual and plans. The automatic coding link between the model and the program um, is basically one click of a button. Traditionally, you don't have the ability to visualise a program. You see bars, and coming from a BIM perspective, I don't understand the bars. Um, I understand the model, and, I, and everybody else understands the model because you can visually see the 3D representation. I think the interface with, with the client and other stakeholders has been very important as well. We're quite close to another lab facility. Uh, the 4D model, the videos are very, very helpful in order to, to let them know what's happening. Everyone can understand, right, okay, so this is what we're doing this week, this is what, we're do, what, we've, we, what we've achieved last week, and this is what we're looking at for six weeks' time. The state's about 600,000 square metres. We have about 350 what we call operational buildings, which are primarily teaching and research or administration buildings. We're working on trying to put a full process with various technologies in between them so that we can bridge the gap between the PIM and the AIM uh, and take the AIM on into the um, life of the building. It's quite interesting that there's not that many people who've, who've gone that route. They tend to either leave it all to the alter the supply chain or the project and then just take the Kobe outputs and put it into their 
um, their CAFEM system. We want to go a little bit further than that being Cambridge anyway. That's where we normally do it. That's quite a gap to bridge at the minute because uh, BIM's always been fo so far focused on construction. Uh, it's very well done. The systems are very well put together and they, they understand it. The bit that comes afterwards is not so well put together and, and so well understood. I mean, I've, I've sat in all, pretty much all of the coordination workshops and um, quite often you hear comments called, would we, have, would we have seen this if it was a, you know, we were looking at 2D drawings, would we have noticed and picked it up? So I think it has helped massively in terms of coordination and accurate design. It was really open and in my view was in the spirit of BIM itself. Um, they were learning, we were learning. It comes down to individuals um, and you know, you get the right team of people working, working together and it can actually be quite fun. Very glad to be involved with this project. Um, it's, it's enhanced my knowledge of BIM. It's enhanced the experience I've had with both the client and the main contractor, which I have to say they've been really good to work with. To get a building that, from an architectural point of view, looks good, as well as obviously pleasing the client and obviously care, being able to build it to that budget. So in that sense, it has been a challenge, an enjoyable one. But a quite a stressful one at times. Certainly Capella has helped showcase to the rest of the business um, you know, what a successful project looks like in terms of client engagement uh, and almost helped us to sort of sell internally if that makes sense. Um, you know, some real senior management are, are starting to look up and, and see the benefits uh, derived. Critically the stuff we've learnt from this is already informing much bigger projects that we've got. Um, with, I've mentioned before we've just embarked on the £300 million Cavendish 3 laboratory. Hugely prestigious, big amounts of money, everything pretty much that we've learnt in this project has been transferred into that project and, and things that weren't quite as good or things we didn't get in time or, and even a rewrite of our um, EIR. Uh, has come about from learning, learning on this project. So, I mean, that's, if, if we're going to talk about value, that, that's an incredible amount of value from this, from this project, I think, because as we said, it sets the, it sets the route uh, and the foundations going forward for bigger, bigger things. <laughs>